Hello German. From what I've experienced with Swipe and many others, new to mid tier experienced players tend to make the same mistakes over and over. This usually leads to exhaustion of repeated failure, of raids, or boredom due to lack of guidance and motivation to do quests and such for traders. Okay, that last bit may or may not have been slightly exaggerated, but that's not really the point here. I'm not here to give full length guides on the game. There's already an ocean of the same video guides I can already make explaining everything you need to know about Tarkov inside out. However, there are a few things streamers and other video creators don't actually mention, but do subconsciously themselves. So firstly, helmets. Helmets are great, don't get me wrong, but if you really think about it, how often do you really get saved by them? More often than not, you're greeted by head eyes. I let out. Okay, cool, I guess. But... Oh, yeah. I'm dead. I'm dead. You died. I died. So, or the new contender for this patch, patch 13, at least from my experience, head jaws. Sparrow. Oh. <laughs> what? Dead. I'm dead. There's two. I am aware of the videos that are already out there on guides for new players recommending the so-called turtle helmet, or what I like to call it, the good old 1960s. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with running one, but honestly do not think it's financially viable. The turtle helmet has the advantage of it being 22k, great for its price, however you're locked out from in my opinion the best headset, the M32s. The vast majority of the players will instead choose to use the GSSHs. They aren't great themselves in audio profile, but they're very cheap in price, coming at 15k. Now, the turtle helmet enjoyers that I do come across are not always the most experienced, hence why they wear the helmet, no flame intended. They usually have themselves in a disadvantageous position to then be greeted by head eyes or head jaws. Now, a quick solution to this problem I'd like to pitch is the shattered mask, or the glorious e-mask from the flea market. Players without access to flea I'll get to shortly afterwards. By the time of this recording, the Sharon mask is sitting around the 20k ruble mark, whilst the glorious e is sitting around the 22k range. This puts the mask in the same price range as the turtle helmet. But now you're thinking, the mask is terrible. Class 1 protection? Really? Alright, hear me out. More often than not, you're tanking a shot to the head, wearing the turtle helmet, thinking it sponged it. But that's rarely the case. Any type of bullet with 30 pen or above is going straight through that piece of tin foil you call a helmet. Instead, the helmet is actually ricocheting the bullet. This brings us back to the mask having a high ricochet chance, which is in line with the helmet. Meaning you have a decent chance of surviving head eyes or head jaws, which in my opinion is more common than top nape or around the top side head area. Now the next point brings the advantage to the masks. Having the ability to wear the M32 headsets into the raid over the GSSH. The GSSHs are a considerable amount cheaper, but cheap doesn't always amount to good. With an increase of 13,000 rubles, you gain a significant advantage in hearing clarity and audio profile wearing the M32s. This can make or break your raid in certain PvP scenarios. But honestly speaking, the patch 13 audio has been absolutely terrible, regardless of what headset I choose to wear, for me at least. If you really want that helmet badly and feel like you're going to get head topped by some scav, that's fine. Run the mask and find your helmet and raid. The amount of gear you can upgrade throughout the raid is crazy, if you know where to look. Jaeger stashes are a great place to start. And yes, I am aware of the stash running guides, so you're free to look up any if you don't have the applicable knowledge of their locations. They are indeed very profitable, but also handy for gear upgrades in raid. Helmets don't just spawn in stashes though. Never sleep on any kind of weapon boxes or green army crates. Recently, I've been seeing people find intelligence spawn in them too, which makes them that much more valuable to hit. Bullets vast majority of new players don't know which are good. There's a simple trick to it, which applies to 90% of the bullets found or seen on the market. Any bullet that starts with a B is good, 
and that includes any calibre. B is always good and there's taste to that good, but just know it is good and you should use it. Don't let it rot in your stash waiting for Tarkov 2 to release before you plan to use the ammo. Next up is 556 and this one is very simple. If you have nothing and we're talking level 1 or level 2 traders, M855 is the best you're getting. If you cannot purchase M855, M855 can be obtained through scavs if they have an ADAR or sometimes the M4 on them. Always check their mags in the rig, other than that, do not really use anything else. It is not worth it. The amount of players I've seen in the level 20 range or below using FMJ for some reason baffles me, but that's fine. Talk of knowledge comes through experience in the end. Now for the good bullets in 556. Anything that ends with A1, so for example, the M856A1 or the M855A1. If you like it in even simpler terms, and this applies to all bullets, inspect the bullet by double clicking and see if it has a black tip. Black tip usually means the bullet is good. Now for all the other bullets, all I can say is either have a Tarkov ammo chart up on speed dial or you can be even more lazy by downloading an app called BattleBuddy on your phone. It was developed by Veritas, a well-known veteran in the Tarkov community and has helped me fact check any ammo I wasn't 100% sure about. The app has a lot of features beside the ammo ballistics which may prove to be useful to any player experienced or not. So up next is performing some fraudulent activities. Now I'm aware that not everyone runs with a duo or a squad, but hear me out. Whenever I run solo, I always ensure my stuff that I can either A, easily replace, on that being the headset, getting another from a dead player, the helmet or a mask, if I may find one in a crate or get it from another dead player, and lastly the backpack, but for backpacks, they vary in value. The bigger ones will almost always get taken. So if you have a small one or a standard scab bag or bird cut, it's worth insuring. Now for armored rigs. They ain't always worth insuring if you're running in a solo. If it's a decent class 4 rig, such as the MMAC, it will get taken near 100% of the time. However, anything lower than that, you should get it back. More on this, if it's by any chance you are wearing a large armoured rig, such as the Anna M1 or the M2 rig, it's quite likely players will not take them due to the size of them being in the bag. On top of that, if it was zeroed out, you're near guaranteeing you'll get it back in insurance. Now when it comes to running duo or a squad, always insure your gear, regardless of what it is. Unless it exceeds 200k on insurance, then there's a chance you might want to rethink your choices. But in case of any scenario you may have died in raid, you still have your duo or squad to throw your gear in the bush. And near guarantee you can run the same kit again for a third of the price. Now for the last point, why do I see people taking out their insurance the second they see a comeback? Insurance stays there for 4 days before it expires. That's 4 days of extra stash space you're getting free of charge. Why and crap up your stash with gear you won't use until later anyway. Now for a bonus tip, when taking stuff out of insurance, you can hold ALT plus left click to instantly equip the stuff from your insurance screen onto your PMC directly. The amount of players I've witnessed dragging their stuff into their stash to equip it out of the insurance screen are far too many. On top of that, the players that don't have any space for the insurance, they will attempt to Tetris their way into making that space for 5 minutes straight very tedious and time inefficient. The quicker you gear up into a raid, the more ruble you make in the long run. Now for gun modding. From my experience, most new players don't understand what attachments are good or not, which results them in being unsure if they should keep such item or not. All attachments in Tarkov that help with recoil or ergonomics actually show their stats if you double click on the item. Also, if you hover over the small arrow on the right side, it even tells you what gun that attachment is applicable for. In terms of stats, any foregrip that gives you minus 2% recoil and any amount of ergonomics is considered standard, meaning good. Anything past that is better. For example, the SE5 foregrip is one of the best in slot in the foregrip category. 
And why is that? It provides the gun with minus 2% recoil and plus 9 ergonomics. Having any grip that is remotely close to those stats is very good and should be used. Now for sights on guns. A lot of newer players that don't have good traders tend to use terrible sights for their weapons, such as the PKL6, rest in peace, the Weaver sight, and the MRS. These red dot sights are absolutely terrible. They wobble too much to land an accurate shot unless you stand completely still and hold your breath by pressing ALT. If you ever try to strafe even the slightest amount, the sight will move way too much for you to restabilize and take an accurate shot. From Peacekeeper Level 1, you are able to purchase the Burris Fastfire Reflex Sight for $166, which requires a Burris Fastfire Weaver Base for an additional $16. This $182 or 20k ruble combo is very clean, stable, and accurate. The small problem with this red dot sight is not every weapon this goes well with, such as the UMP and the MP5 to name a few. The front iron sight will be blocking the red dot vision, making it very hard to aim with these weapons. Now for scaving. Don't get me wrong, going for a scav to get ruble is great. Having the addition of getting given random sets of gear with zero risks to a new player is perfect for them. The ability for a new player to have no attachment to the gear they've been given is great. So let's say if they were to perish, they don't feel as bad. However, if that player is just doing scav runs with very minimal PMC runs, that is not very good. Let me explain why. Put into simple terms, what is 10 million rubles good for when you cannot spend on anything besides budget kits and lightly modded weapons? Leveling your PMC is necessary in game progression. If you were to do PMC runs like a scav and die, you'd lose a bit more rubles. However, you'll still gain soft skill experience like endurance, strength, search skill, looting skill, and most important of all, actual experience to progress you closer into the next level. Levels are required for high trader reputation and better gear unlocks. I am aware of gear fear, we've all been there, and it's not as hard to get out of it as you think. One thing I like saying is that if the gear is in your stash unused for the entire wipe cycle, then it's as good as lost, or worse. It's lost gear that is taking up stash space and stash space is invaluable. There are containers in the game made so you can save as much of that stash space as possible to allow the player for more item storage. Running scav permanently will not make you a better player if all you do is loot all day and gain ruble. Alright, I hope you learned something new today and that might help you in your future raids.